everyone. I would like to warmly welcome you to this edition of our Tuesday webinar. Um, our Tuesday seminar tries to highlight um, contemporary events in Latin America. And I am just, uh, I'm Fran Hagopi, and I'm very happy to be moderating today's session. And before we take one more step, I want to introduce my co-moderator and the director of the David Rockefeller Center of Latin American Studies that hosts these webinars, Steve, and my great colleague, Steve Levitsky. Hi, everybody. Um, and so, and the next, the next uh, thing I want to do is to acknowledge the great staff that we have at Dr. Class. Um, Paola Ibarra, who is our assistant director, Jillian Scales is our uh, events coordinator, and Gabriel Patterson is the person who makes these webinars possible. I thank them all um, for their organization. I thank them all for making this uh, webinar possible. Um, this event is being recorded and you will be able to see, um, um, you'll be able to have access to it on our YouTube channel, which will be available after the event. You can also find our events um, on our, um, on our webpage as well. And the link, I think Gabby will drop that link into the chat for you all. Um, so this, the, we've done a few different things as we've been experimenting with this webinar format. Um, and one of the things that we've done is to um, highlight some series, but we've also tried to maintain a great tradition at Dr. Class, and that is bringing timely scholarship on very important topics to, um, to our broader audience um, in the hemisphere and perhaps around the world. And today is one of those special events. Today we are honored to be joined by Mariano Sanchez de Langer, who will present his forthcoming book, The Geography of State Power, Political Antagonism and Partisan State Building in Colombia and Mexico. This is going to be a, land before I introduce Mariano, let me introduce the subject. This is going to be a landmark work because we all know that, um, the, that states um, do not evenly control their territory. We all know that subnational politics is very important, but we don't really have a good enough grasp on why subnational politics varies as it does and why the state has got different sort, different capacities to control violence, to extract resources from its territory. Mariano has done a amazing, is done an amazing forthcoming book. And this book um, answers the question of why. Why states develop more effective authority in some parts of their territory and domains of governance than in others. And as you'll see today, he looks at the historical lines of political conflict, whether they're religious or partisan, at formative moments of state building. We have, so let me now introduce um, Mariano as a scholar, and then I will introduce our discussant. So Mariano is currently an academy scholar at our at the Acad Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies, which is affiliated here with our partner institute, the Weatherhead Center of International Studies. Mariano did his PhD at Cornell, and he um, his first position in Mexico was at CIDE. He was assistant professor of politics at the Centro de eh, Investigación y Docencia Económicas. And he will be moving when he finishes his academy fellowship to the COLMEX, to Colegio de Mexico, to the Center for International Studies there. Um, Mariano has um, made a mark for himself in the field of state building, democracy, inequality, and historical institutional development with a regional focus on Latin America. He's a, he's, I, 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 it's too late to say he's a rising star. He's a star. Um, we've enjoyed having him around the academy and the time that he's been in residence with us. And I can say personally, he's one of the most generous colleagues that I've ever had. Um, and to comment on this book, we've brought in um, a heavy hitter. 
Um, sorry, it's a baseball day in America. We've brought in Sebastian Mazuka, who was also an Academy Scholar. We also got to know. So he's an old friend as well. Sebastian um, did his MA and his PhD in political science at Berkeley. And he also took a master's in economics there. As I said, he was also a member of our um, Academy for International and Area Studies. And he too is an expert on state formation, regime change and economic development. And he has recently himself published a landmark work. We've been waiting for this book for a long time. Latecomer State Formation, Political Geography and Capacity Failure in Latin America. That has come out from Yale and it's hot off the presses. On political economy, he has published also on political economy and on democratization. He's edited three volumes of essential readings with the Camara Andina de Fomento. And on democratization, he co-authored a book with Gerardo Munch from Cambridge that came out last year. And the name of that book is Middle Quality Institution Trap. He's also published in all the top journals in political science and the Oxford Handbook of Political Science as well. So um, we're incredibly delighted to have both of these they're still young to me, young scholars uh, with us today. And first we'll have Mariano present um, his book and we've done, we've asked him to do something impossible and that's present a complex and a rich book in 20 to 25 minutes. And then we'll have about 10 minutes of comments from Sebastian before we open this up to all of you. We have disabled um, the, your comments in the chat but we have opened up the question and answer function in your Zoom um, button. So if you want to leave a question at any time during the session, you can drop that question into the question and answer period. Steve and I will take turns presenting your questions to the panelists in rounds once they have finished speaking. Without further ado, I want to turn this over to Mariano. Welcome, Mariano. Thank you very much, Fran, for such a generous introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here today, to everyone at Dr. Class and to the audience for, for tuning in. It is a great honor to be back uh, at Dr. Class and to have a discussion, uh, discussion no other than Sebastian, whose book is already, I think, changing the field. And today I will, uh, as Fran said, try to do something impossible, which is to present uh, uh, the book so I will not try to you know, cover it all. I will just give you some uh, of the theoretical framework I've been working on and some, con some overview of the basic empirical contents of the book. And I will speak about state building in Colombia and Mexico historically, but to be more precise, uh, I will be speaking about a particular modality of this key process of political development, which is building states. And a modality that, that I will argue uh, was predominant in both of these countries and one that helps understand many important outcomes related to the state's ability to tax, the state's ability to provide public goods, to maintain uh, law and order, to establish the rule of law, and to create uh, or not to create the kind of universality in rights and duties within their borders that from a normative perspective defines political rule by modern states. This modality, I have termed uh, partisan state building. And so I am still playing a little bit with the title of the book, but I think this encapsulates uh, more or less what I, want to, what I want to say. By partisan state building, I mean a process by which political parties appropriate the state machinery, develop state institutions, expand the state's reach and build capacity. But to do so, uh, they do so in a context of deep, intense, highly polarized hegemonic struggles with political rivals, indeed with political enemies, political enemies that are located within the polity itself. Partisan state building spawns not weak states, doesn't spawn strong states in any simple sense. It doesn't spawn states that are present or absent or other simplifying dichotomies that are often invoked when we're speaking about state building. Partisan state building leads appropriately speaking, to partisan states. And analyzing state building as an intrinsically partisan process of domination over internal antagonists, I argue, can help us understand a salient characteristic of states in Colombia, in Mexico, 
and much of Latin America and the so-called developing world, which is the highly uneven level of penetration of territory and society, and as a result, their highly uneven ability to provide public goods and their highly uneven ways of exercising power. Institutions we know from scholarly observation, but also from political experience, carry with them uh, historical legacies. And so the states reach across territory, the linkages to different social constituencies, their governance practices, and capacities at a very disaggregated level, and I'm going to try to show you some evidence of this disaggregation, are a reflection of the historical antagonisms in which the state was forged. To say it briefly, the central organizing argument uh, of the book is that the, is that the state's penetration of territory and society in the cases that concern us today, and potentially more broadly, was a highly partisan process that was structured by these historical antagonisms, and that led the geography of the state, the geography of state capacities in a territorial and in a social sense to mirror the geography of partisanship. The lines of political demarcation configure the patterns of inward state building. And so by uncovering the political alignments along historical cleavages across geography, we can make sense of the state's uneven development, which takes not the simple form of high capacity in some regions and low capacity in others, but of some complex institutional patterns of capacity being developed in some areas and not others, sometimes in unexpected way, but with a single rational explanation, which is the idea that state builders and state makers develop the state in order to subordinate partisan rivals, and partisan rivals and their coalition bases react to state building projects in partisan ways, and therefore state investments are uneven and social receptiveness to the state is also uneven along salient lines of antagonism. Prominent arguments about reinforcing cycles of coercion, extraction, bureaucratization, and service provision in dominant uh, arguments about state formation and state building, most of them coming from Western Europe, um, in war-led processes of state formation, have created this tendency to approach state capacity as a bundle of positively correlated at attributes in which the state can, can tax, can coerce, can provide services, can do all at the same time. Yet in state building across territory and society, not all capacities go together. The map of the tax state, the map of the coercive state, the map of the education state, they can indeed look very differently, very different from each other. And this is not an accident. This is not an unruly process. It, it is the direct effect of partisan state building. And so in the rest of the presentation, I would like to do two main things. First, I will make a few general points, the more theoretical points about the study of state building and quickly go over the book's theoretical framework, the general structure that tries to um, hold all the empirical pieces together. And second, I will walk you through some of the substantive empirical content of the book, although for reasons of time, I will not, uh, view, I will not be exhaustive. So a few general observations and elements of the theory. And I will um, start sharing my, my screen now. So give me just a couple of seconds to move full screen mode here. So I will start with the more theoretical aspect of it. And so the first point that I want to make is that we need much more domestic politics in the study of state building. Much of our understanding of state formation and state capacity development comes from the experience of developed countries, and in particular from Western Europe. And most of the attention has been on the international forces that made the modern state, in particular war and preparation for war. In his recent book, uh, the, this, the, our discussion, Sebastian Mazuka explains how Latin America followed not a war-led path to state formation, but a trade-led path to state formation, and convincingly argues that this created political units that would other, otherwise have not been, would not have the borders that they currently have, and probably would not be as patrimonial should Latin America had been caught in the kind of recurrent war making uh, that characterized Europe. Now, how did this relative lack of sustained external threats affect the state? And how does it affect state building? One argument that I make is that it produced very partisan state building. In the literature on the rise of strong states in developed countries, war makes the state primarily through an organizational mechanism. 
Rulers at constant war with foreign enemies were compelled to extract revenues, to extract taxes, to raise armies, to centralize power, to eliminate uh, internal sovereigns, to modernize the state administration, and so on and so forth. There's an, another important mechanism in that literature, and they, it is that international wars of mass mobilization foster internal cohesion. They strengthen national identities, identification of the population with ruling institutions. They create higher levels of trust in the state and more willingness to cooperate with domestic partisan rivals and to pursue the collective interest of defending the nation and succeeding in the war. And so major episodes of state building in these countries were associated with war with broad based, as broad based collective enterprises. I suggest that this was key in the state's penetration of territory and society and in producing relatively even patterns of institutional development, for example, in setting up tax systems and so on and so forth. But what, ha what happens elsewhere in the absence of such unifying threats inducing robust states? The lack of sustained external pressures also created few instances of state building, I argue in Latin America, in which the political other was a foreign enemy. Instead, the political other was very often inside borders themselves. Peaceful international relations allowed internal antagonisms to reproduce without restraint and those who won the partisan battles built partisan states based on narrower subsegments of the population and internally more territorially differentiated according to the geography of partisanship. This leads me to the second point about the territorial differentiation, uh, differentiation of the state. I said that we need more domestic politics in the study of state building, but we also need more systematic attention to the spatial component of state building. The state is a territorial organization, and therefore state building is by definition a spatial process. Examining subnational variation here is not, as, is often, as it often is in political science, this is not a research design strategy. This is not uh, just to expand the range of variation that we're examining. This is a conceptual necessity. The extension of the state's reach is examined laterally in dominant approaches or dominant theories of warlord state building as a byproduct of the need to fight uh, external enemies. But with larger political units that did not have such kind of external antagonisms, we need a working theoretical scheme to make sense of how states develop across geographic space and institutional domains simultaneously. And so the book uh, takes these two premises to advance a framework about the development of the state within borders. In this framework, uh, I use cleavage structures as the roadmap to navigate and comprehend the process of territorial penetration and the differentiation of the state. And by a cleavage, I simply mean for now the dominant polarities in a political system, the dominant political antagonisms, the fractures that divide us versus them. I want to be clear, cleavages are not immutable. Uh, immutable. We know they are, there's nothing automatic in certain social divisions becoming active political divides. They vary with context. They can be about uh, socioeconomic conflict. They can be about religion. They can be about uh, confrontations between a national culture and peripheral culture. There's classic work in sociology about cleavages, but for now, I will simply term them the dividing lines between us versus them. And of course, they can be shaped themselves by parties and the state over the long run. So there is an obvious recursivity or if you want endogeneity between state building and cleavage structures. But the key point is that at specific historical junctures in which governing coalitions hold power, they find it necessary to invest in state capacity. They are embedded in a system of antagonisms. They are embedded in a system of internal polarities in a given cleavage structure that is not fully under their control, that is conditioned by history, by mobilized social actors, and that determines their outlook, their institutional choices, on what they need to do to maintain power, to maintain their support bases, uh, and to defeat partisan rivals. And so this is a very, you know, it's a simplification, uh, and I would say this is a very simplified version of, of the theoretical scheme in the book, but so, I take cleavage structures as this defining component that will shape the geography of the state based on the geography of partisanship, the geography of distribution of support for state building coalitions and their rivals. 
And so cleavages are typically involved in, involved to explain the development of parties themselves, so party systems, but I am here deploying them to explain patterns of subnational variation in state capacity and in the territorial differentiation of the state. In other words, they configure the state. How do cleavages as the prevailing political antagonisms shape state building and thereby future state capacity outcomes in the long run? I argue in two main ways. First, because the partisan coalitions in power, they make uneven investments in state capacity based on these friend enemy distinctions. The geography of partisanship shapes the spatial location of the state's institutional effort and the type of institutional investments. They may develop or try to develop tax capacities, capacities to careers, to surveil, to educate the population, to provide some services, depending on who is friend, who is a friend and who is an enemy, and where in the territory they exert more influence. So the antagonism and its geography structures the efforts of governing coalitions, uh, and so they shape the type and level of institutional presence of the state across different dimensions. And second, this is the second force uh, by which cleavage structures uh, end up shaping ultimate state capacity outcomes, is that the legitimacy of the state also varies sharply along partisan lines. There is little differentiation between the state and the party, and therefore out partisans resist the state, sometimes overtly, sometimes covertly, sometimes violently, sometimes through nonviolent resistance. But these uneven attitudes toward the state shape how institutions develop, what the state can do, and ultimately, in the future, state capacity outcomes. And so patterns of state capacity, things that we measure later on across geography, can reflect historical political antagonisms, the historical lines of antagonism that prevail during these state building, historical state building episodes. Through a continuity in both the type and level of institutional presence of the state, but also the attitudes of different social groups to the state itself. I apply this framework to state building in Colombia and Mexico in the 20th century. And there is a reason why uh, I will focus on the 20th century and especially in the first half. And the reason is to say very shortly is that if in Latin America, the 19th century was the century of state formation, the 20th century and specifically the first half of the 20th century was the period of state penetration of territory and society. Right. And of course, you know, simplifying a very complex history here, but the massification of the state, a substantial expansion in its infrastructures across territory and the development of capacities to intervene in society at unprecedented levels came in these first decades of the 20th century with revolution in Mexico, in many other countries after the Great Depression, this forced states to develop internal systems of taxation. This is also the century of the expansion of mass education. And so, although we, of course, need to go back to the 19th century to understand how states formed and so how these cleavages came to be in the first place, uh, which is sort of the left-hand side of the, of the uh, image here, the period of the caging of social relations and the creation of these cleavages, later on, state building periods in the first half of the 20th century and later on were conditioned by these underlying forces and shaped these patterns of uh, partisan state development. And so the cases, I'm looking at uh, Colombia and Mexico um, as two countries that share something very important uh, based on this inheritance from the 19th century. And it is that they inherited strong cleavage structures, a fracture or fractures that split both countries to the core in repeated civil wars in the 19th century. And as the state penetrated territory and society in the 20th, these cleavages would strongly influence the nature and outcomes of state building. State building, so to speak, unfolded upon divided grounds. And the shape of the state, its capacities across territory, its linkages with different social groups, would mirror those underlying fractures, creating a complex and uneven geography of power that deviated quite strongly from the ideal type of a modern state governing uniformly across the territory. Yet in other important dimensions, Mexico and Colombia followed opposite political trajectories. The hegemonic struggle between secularizing liberals and conservative defenders of the Catholic Church defined both countries in the 19th century since independence, but it ended with opposite outcomes across the cases. In Mexico, liberals defeated conservatives, 
uh, an exhausted conservatism as a political force, and it set the basis for a secular state, a project that fiercely anti-clerical revolutionaries would complete in the first decades of the 20th century. Owing to liberals' victory, Mexico retained a federal constitutional design, a secular state, and in fact, a very anti-clerical state uh, in this important state-building period in the first half of the 20th century. In Colombia, in contrast, conservatives emerged victorious from the partisan wars of the 19th century. After several rounds of confrontation, a new constitution uh, in 1886, and then uh, conquer that with the Vatican that compensated the church for uh, loss of property. It alienated liberals, conservatives ended up defeating the conservatives, and this set up very different institutional basis for the state uh, in which conservatives were dominant until 1930. And after 1930, there was an important period called the liberal republic in which liberals come back to power, try to, uh, you know, uproot the legacy of, cons of conservative dominance over the state, but in this very sharp cleavage between liberal and conservatives that had been unfolded, unfolding forever. So these differences will allow me to sort of uh, speak to the external validity of the argument about the partisan or the partisan nature of state building shaping the geography of state power, but in two cases that throughout the 20th century follow many opposite paths because the states that emerge are very different from each other. And so the rest of the book, the empirical content looks at different dimensions uh, or institutional dimensions of the state uh, in key domains, starting for example with taxation. And I will speak uh, very, very briefly about each of these dimensions um, and present some of the main findings of, and I would say one of the important contributions of the book is that for all these different dimensions I built new historical data sets at a very disaggregated level for both countries trying, trying to map uh, state capacities and their development over time. So I will present briefly about the tax state. So this is how um, tax revenues for the central government unfold in both uh, Mexico and Colombia in the first half um, of the 20th century and then later on. And the important thing to no, notice here is that so they follow a similar trajectory, but if we compare them to other countries in Latin America, Colombia and Mexico lag behind in tax capacity and ability to extract resources, in particular in the first half of the 20th century. This is the time period in which they fall uh, behind not only the rest of the world, but also even compared to other countries in the region like Brazil or Argentina. So we need to focus on understand what happened in those periods. And it's also an important period because it is for the first time when states are mobilizing revenues domestically. It is for the first time states are substantially penetrating fiscally the territory. They are uh, raising domestic taxes uh, for the first time. So this is in Mexico how if we disaggregate uh, tax collection, they stop depending on, uh, on customs revenues and for the first time they start implementing corporate income taxes, the personal income tax, and even uh, and also indirect taxes. And so the fiscal basis of the state change. Also in Colombia, we see this transition in this first half of the century. For the, for the first time, the state is substantially penetrating territory and society to mobilize uh, resources. Now, based on my argument, and so this is just an illustration, so this is how the number of tax offices in Mexico just before the revolution or in 1912. And so look how this process looks just 40 years later. This, this is the number of tax offices uh, 40 years later. So there's a process of fiscal penetration. Now, this is very uneven. And so this is looking at different Mexican states and tax extraction from the federal government. And I'm uh, gonna, I'm, I know I'm about to, my time is about to run out. So give me just a couple of minutes to go over, over this. Um, we see how the state starts extracting with the unevenness of the state. And so this is the variation across different states in Mexico. And this is federal tax collection across states also starts growing. Right? And so if we look at the geography of this, what we see is that the tax state uh, just failed to prosper, failed to penetrate in areas of deep Catholic contention and Catholic resistance to the state. This is the contrast between states in Mexico uh, that were below average and above average participation in the Catholic Cristero War, which was a counter-revolutionary moment uh, during the 20s and 30s. And so this maps very strongly with the Mexican states 
fiscal capacity across the territory in this period. Now, this doesn't mean that the state is simply weak. The federal government responds confiscating truck property and so develops a very strong presence in these areas through the confiscation of church property, opening schools in those uh, former church properties. So this is not a simple story about, okay, the, the state becomes weak in this sense in these areas. The process, it's also, it's only that the state penetrates very differently uh, depending on these political alignments. So by the mid 1940s, after this important process, we see how tax collection um, across the country has grown very unevenly depending on the geography of revolutionary support versus counter-revolutionary contention. Also in Colombia, we see a similar process in which it is liberals who push for tax reform, who push income taxes, who push corporate uh, income taxes, and yet this process fails, especially in conservative areas of the territory because conservatives resist the tax state. Now, if we move to other dimensions of the state, coercive capacity, for example, Mexican state penetrates the territory also, develops coercive capacities, allies with peasant militias that become you know, kind of the backbone of the army in localities, but this process is very shaped, again, by this underlying cleavages. And so the mobilization of peasant militias, which would exert a very long influence uh, in the rule of law in Mexico today, shaping patterns of vigilantism, for example, and uh, patterns of uh, in the drug trade is very shaped by this early conflict between revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries. So I won't go over uh, the details of this part of the argument, um, but if we move on to other dimensions of the state, like land reform, the ability to redistribute land and to penetrate the territory in this other way, we also see that geography being determined by the underlying cleavage dominating at the time. So this is for the case of Mexico. For the case of Colombia, when liberals try to implement land reform, conservatives react, for example, by appropriating the local state. And we see an increase in legibility in the sense of the number of properties registered in the land cadastre. This allows conservatives to defend and resist uh, land reform. At the same time, uh, the, the state is wholly unable to extract property taxes in those same areas, uh, in conservative areas. This is replicated in the penetration of, the, of uh, society through education. Um, and so I will end. These are the four main uh, domains of institutional activity that I look at in, in the book. I won't have the time to uh, go over the details of the findings of pitch, but I hope that this will uh, at least be provocative enough to uh, spark a conversation and to invite you all to read the book when it's ready. And sorry for going a little over time and many thanks again for um, the invitation and the possibility of presenting these findings. Don't apologize at all. We were delighted to hear um, what you what, what, about more about the book, and I, I look forward to the discussion. But first, we look forward to Sebastian's comments. So, Sebastian, please. Unmute you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, super happy to be here. Uh, obviously, super happy to be part of the Tuesday seminars. I guess it's my 10th time uh, here, and I love it. It's been a long time since the last time, so I'm super happy about that. I, uh, I love Steve. I love Fran. So what can I say? Very happy. And the other big reason to be happy is that Mariano's uh, research is just, without exaggeration, I think it's mind-blowing. I find it amazing. Uh, and so... I thought I knew a little bit about, uh, I don't know, pre-mass politics, uh, politics, pre-mass pre politics, uh, or pre-mass society politics in Latin America, and I learned a lot. And I think that this idea of partisan state building, and I strongly emphasize that concept, partisan state building 
is novel, is original, is fresh, and does a lot of work. Does a lot of work that needed to be done. Uh, it's very important. Partisan state building. Maybe, perhaps, a substitute that he might consider for final publication from the final market is cleavage driven state building. It's also an interesting phrase for the same concept. I think it's very, very, very interesting. Um, uh, and, and that is essentially, that is the cost that's in the, the independent variable. So for the outcome variable, I would try to avoid repeating partisan, to tell you the truth. Uh, that's a cosmetic suggestion because you have partisan is the process. And what you want to have as the outcome is something that is uneven state building or segmented state building or partial state building. Uh, so I would like to separate the partisan process from the partisan outcome, even though it's driven by partisan considerations. I think that is that is amazing. So just that idea, right? That the idea that there's a partisan process of state building, uh, that explains these patterns of spatial and um, functional unevenness in state building in countries, I think that's, well, I mean, I wish I had that idea. <laughs> I, no matter how long I had thought about that, I wouldn't have come with that idea. And I think it's a great, 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 great idea. So what I will do is just to put that idea in context, I think, uh, and then, sort of, because I think it's worth sort of put it there on the podium of big ideas. I will try to do that first. And then I will also use that to make my sort of critical comments. That's what, what you paid ticket for, right? Uh, or that's what you're here for. So uh, let me try to, yeah, uh, justify the money. Uh, so put the thing in, in context. So Beber, Beber is Beber. So, okay, so we, we have Beber here, chapter nine on political communities, which is the chapter in which he really is the best treatment that we have so far of this on the state, not Beber's treatment, just everywhere. Uh, so he has this chapter, chapter nine on economy and society, political communities. We have real political communities is a big category there, but it's really for territorial political organization, which for Beber is the modern state, right? So Beber in chapter nine has sort of the canon of the theory or the conceptualization of the modern state Later on, so you have the communities, the state is one specific type of community, the most relevant one. You go like 26 pages later, 26 pages later, after he introduces the, 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 the concept of political community and the state, finally you get into party. It's 26 pages late. That means that for Beber there was a clear sequence. You build a state and then at some point, maybe decades later, maybe centuries later, Parties emerge. <laughs> so, so parties are essentially there, like, um, I don't know, adornments to something that was created like decades before, which is the state. And I like this very much. I love this idea that, well, you know what? Maybe parties and, and, and states are built at the same time. It's very anti Beberian, but it's very right. And so, if you're anti Beberian, uh, but you're right, then, then you know that you have something very big. Right, because there's that, that is like there's there's no stronger proof that you have something to say that if you if you say that something that's anti beberian and it's very strong and I think that's that's the way to frame this. Uh, so here you are in page nine hundred, here page nine twenty six, but it's 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 not only a difference in twenty six pages, it's a difference in in a century for Weber's history. First, you get the the the, the state the rational bureaucracy, the capacity, and then later on come the parties to play a little bit with that within the confines of our already built states. And Mariana is really saying, well, partisan state building. Okay, <laughs> partisan state building. So parties are there at the same time or before of building state capacity. And I like that very, very, very much. Um, it speaks to my um, my research a lot. I will spend one minute doing some kind of self-promotion and but actually product differentiation. Uh, what I do is um, is I separate state formation for state building. I think this is an important distinction. Very, very important. And it's part of the sort of, I think it, it, it is part of the studying 
state formation and state building outside Europe, we need to disaggregate these two concepts into two different things. State formation is something that's very basic, Bavarian minimalist, in the same way that we have a minimalist definition of democracy, state formation has a minimalist definition, which is territory consolidation and violence monopolization. And that is big because it's, that's the same as country creation. You, you have those two things, you have a country essentially. State building is a different thing. Uh, state building is the extinction of patrimonialism, right? Uh, the creation of meritocratic capable bureaucracies and capacity construction. It's, it's, it's just that. It, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. Can happen at the same time, can, can happen at different times. So this is what I do in my book. I, I want to ask whether state formation is a precursor of state building and the answer is yes for Europe, whether it's a barrier for state building. You have a, you form a state, but then that state is a barrier for, for subsequent state building or it's neutral and that I don't have cases. Precursor Europe, barrier uh, Latin America and neutral, I just, it's a theoretical possibility that I don't have any empirical uh, con, um, case for that. So, okay, so this is how I, I understand. I, I think I want, I want to highlight uh, Mariano's contribution the best way I can. So we have state formation, can be world led, or trade led. This is the external part that Mariano thinks it's, it's been done too much. And I think he, I agree with that. It's been done too much. World led, trade led. World led is the pioneers in Europe. Trade led is the latecomer states of Latin America. Now, this is, this is what I think Mariano does. And I want to differentiate it from what I do. Uh, so in world led, states are strong. This, sorry for the simplifications. Just it's, it's, I have only a few minutes. So. Trade-led creates weak states, fine. Okay, this is very basic, very simple. Uh, and so in essentially in war-led process, state formation and state building go together. In state formation that's trade-led, state formation and state building not only decouple, but also the formation of a state creates obstacles against state building. Okay, this is, this is, this is I think, okay, so this is the setup. When I move from part one of my book to part two, I move from external to internal. And in internal, the week, I have three paths to state formation, not state building. Port driven, law driven, and party driven. And party driven, I'm glad to know, I have, I didn't know this, so this is how I get so excited. Mexico and Colombia are there, like party driven state formation. I also have Uruguay in that case. Port driven is Argentina and Brazil, or driven Venezuela, Guatemala, Peru. Okay. So, okay. So this is a massive convergence between Mariano's work and my work. I only have additional Uruguay there as party driven state formation. Okay, fine. Now, party driven state formation, I say, uh, so par there's party driven state formation, which is sort of my concept and there's partisan state building which is Mariano's concept. So what's the difference? And it's huge and, it's, I'm, and, and I'm envious because it's, it's a very important difference. It's, 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 it's a very interesting difference. For me, party-driven state formation has a positive effect on state formation in the, in the sense of territory consolidation, but has a, an unambiguously negative effect on state building. Unambiguously negative effect on state building. And there comes Mariano and says, well, what? Yes. Partisan state building has maybe positive but partial effects on state on state building. And I think I, I think I'm simplifying. I apologize for that. In the Q and A, the things can be unpacked. But here we can have positive effects of partisan state building on state building, but uh, it's, it's partial because you build parts of the states or part on parts of the territory and the real. Is there's a real sort of the negative effect because we are studying Latin America and we also have to look at negative effects. So uh, the negative effect is that there's a, this an unevenness or a, a lack of territorial and functional uniformity. And I think this is the way where Mariano's contribution is really the key. The key is that if you have partisan state building, which is different from uh, party led state formation, you will have this strange effect that as Fran mentioned early on are really what is one of the most pressing topics in Latin America. We know a lot about unevenness, but we don't know why, and this is, and this is it. Why? Well, because why do we have this unevenness? Because of partisan state building. Okay, so set up now, I, uh, how, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm, I'm perfect. 
Um, uh, these are my comments for Mariana, so pay attention. Uh, if you were not, just try to wake up uh, because I bored you too much before. Now it's time to. The key question to me of partisan state building is I mean, I think the theory is underdeveloped. And, and, and when you develop theory, I mean, there are two things that you do is mechanisms and interactions. But so let's ask first about through which mechanisms does partisan state building create state building? produce states. What, what are the mechanisms? To me, they are not clear. They are not clear in the sense that you mentioned one mechanism, which I like very much, which is imposition. This is partisan. This is what you're telling. You have all this continental philosophy behind you supporting your claim of Schmittian and, and, and partisanship and sort of uh, partial and imposition and rulers and, and so, and um, uh, search for supremacy and all that. So you have imposition. So I say, well, if you have imposition, I like it very much. I haven't read the, the rest of the book. I only read what you sent, but I'm imagining that what you have is partisan goods. Sort of the, the state, a party produces uh, goods that are compatible or foster their partisan agenda. And that's why sometimes you talk about zero sum games. You say politics is not always about zero sum games, but there is this partisan agenda in state building because there are these cleavages, there is this polarization. So when a party is in power, they create goods that are favorable, or I don't know what exactly what, but they are favorable to the party agenda, to the supremacy, to maybe they distort the electoral field in order to favor the party or the party ideology, some kind of uh, extra instrument in the partisan fight. And uh, so but this cannot be the only mechanism, even in the partisan state building. I can think of thinking about um, tons of research that's been done in post-communist parties. Uh, uh, um, Gizmala Buse, Anna has done great work uh, and also state building in the US. There's competition, not just imposition. So sometimes parties compete and instead of creating partisan goods, they create public goods. And how's that? Well, I mean, we want to win elections. So maybe a part, two parties that are competing with each other, I can theorize that there's another mechanism by which every party tries to produce a better version of the public good that the, the prior party has, has produced. Um, and, and that is essentially the story of many countries, parties competing with each other, to, uh, trying to outcompete each other in order to to, to create increasingly better public goods instead of, instead of partisan public goods. And those two mechanisms are theoretically possible. I, I'm not saying that they are empirically true always and everywhere, but there are these two possibilities. One is imposition, partisan good. Another one is creating increasingly better public goods. Uh, it is a very simple distinction. Of course, if you scratch my surface, you will find complications in two minutes about this, uh, but there's no time for that. Okay. so so. There are these two mechanisms, two possible mechanisms. I think Mariani only looks at imposition as opposed to competition. And then the, the other question is, well, under what conditions does partisan state building creates, creates these uneven or partisan states? That's the question. To me, that is the question. Because it's not universal. You cannot say that this partisan state building producing uneven states is universal. So under what conditions? Well, under what conditions? I, I don't know exactly, but I, we, can, we can imagine, right? We can imagine like three basic scenarios, a real stalemate between parties, uh, a party and, and that they know that they're going to be rotating in power for a long time. And that's one thing. Another one is that, well, I know that, but despite that, I will try to, in a way, uh, gain an advantage that over time is going to create a hegemony, or I just wipe you out from the map with a, with a war. I liquidate you. And so, so under what conditions? So it, it is whether a party is going to do imposition or public goods really depends on the balance of power between the parties and their expectations. So those, to me, those, the, the under what conditions, not through which mechanism, the other question, under what conditions the parties and state building has the effects that you claim it has is, is, a, is a crucial question. And that has to do, as a, 
first order condition would be what is the balance of power between the parties? What is what are the expected? Uh, are they expecting stalemate? Are what what are they expecting? Okay, so let me say this: Mexico uh, is clear in position to me because I mean, you know, the conservatives were defeated and they were defeated and discredited, and so one party could impose. Colombia, to me, it's not clear <laughs> that one party could impose. Maybe one. They, are, they were alternating on imposition, but maybe the liberals and the conservatives were actually trying to improve on, on, on what the prior guy was doing, uh, especially in terms of modernizing the economic infrastructure of the country. Uh, and then I can think of Chile and Uruguay. Chile and Uruguay are also two countries in which you have partisan state building in the sense of Mariano, but they were competing to produce better and better public goods. They are still doing it uh, up until today. Well, until the day before yesterday, in the case of Chile, at least. And in Uruguay, they are still doing. They alternate in power. They don't produce partisan goods. They produce public goods, increasingly better versions of public goods. Uh, so Chile and Uruguay are, are, are sort of also party-driven, or in my, in my vocabulary, party led state formation. But that, that competition between parties and also in Costa Rica, they led to better and better public goods, not partisan states. Uh, so. I think that distinction between partisan goods and public goods would be useful if introduced in, in, in your book. And then finally, the USA. I mean, once you look at the 19th, I mean, if there's a place in which parties played a big role in, in building states, forming states and building states is the USA. And, and, and there's no carpet in, in, in this theoretical, uh, in this, so Carpenter is sort of the guy who in inaugurated the, the idea of building capacity through parties. Uh, parties and courts as building the capacities of the US states, federal state. And also sometimes the subnational, sub subnational states, parties. Uh, so, and in the USA you have, obviously there were some different conditions because you have partisan state building, but you don't have partisan goods. You have a big chunk, or you have partisan public goods, partisan goods, but also you have big chunks of public goods. So that thing of the dynamics here that you identify cannot work uh, uni uh, unilinearly everywhere. Um, how am I doing on time? Do you want me to stop? If you can, if you can wrap up, it would be good. Well, I will wrap up. OK, so just one minute. I'll try to add something. Yeah. One minute. One, one minute. minute. No one, one minute to wrap up, just not to cut it cold turkey like this. OK. Uh, so, um, the, uh, this, the kind of approach that Marino has is, is, is lovely because it will combine historical approach with granular um, and statistical ident identification, microdata. I like it a lot. Um, he has this assumption from comparative historical analysis that episodes of state building are critical junctures, that the legacies are strong. And this approach, which is sort of the epistemology of the book, I will say, I will think that in the book version, we'll have to face or address some of these three challenges that, I, that I'm going to, to mention. One is, when, how do you know that a juncture was critical, uh, especially in these episodes of bursts of state building? Are some more critical than others? To me, state formation is a critical juncture. And I, I spent like half a chapter justifying it. And it, it, to me, I felt it completely necessary. Uh, the second point is that because state formation in 19th century, because of the outcomes of state formation in 19th century, I don't think in the 20th century you have too much room for state building. Uh, so it's not that you can sort of completely uh, decouple the 20th century for the, for, from the 19th century. And finally, uh, I find in Colombia and Mexico that there was nonpartisan state building in some junctures, which is in Mexico during the restored republic, after the, the war, the French war, uh, really the restored republic created a ton of public goods. Um, and, and the conservatives were, I don't think were around or were around, but they were so defeated, discredited that they modernized the economy and they penetrated the country with railways. Uh, and it was a pretty amazing period in modernization and infrastructure in, in, in no way that, that you can call partisan. Uh, or partisan good. Maybe it was a partisan initiative, but it was a public good. And then Colombia. In Colombia, 
you have the Reyes period and, in, and, the, and the big modernization of the Colombia economy after 1903 happens really with a big agreement between liberals and conservatives. Uh, and it's like 30, it's the Republic of Coffee. It's 30 years of the takeoff of the, of the, of the, Mexi, of the, Colombian, econo of the Colombian economy and it's done under a ton of state building, which is not partisan, which is co collective public goods, essentially railroads, sports, warehouses. Um, so that's it. Okay. <laughs> well, that was, only Sebastian could begin with Weber um, and take us through a couple of centuries um, of Latin American states, but you've raised so many interesting questions. And I think that um, we should give the floor back to Mariano at this point to address those really rich comments before we open this up for a broader discussion. Wow, uh, thank you, Fran, and thank you, Sebastian, for such a close reading and such useful feedback. Uh, there's you've given me a lot to think about, so I will try to make justice to your comments in the manuscript, although I'm not sure I have the full answers right now, but I will address a couple of the points that, that you raised. And so first for this suggestion about, you know, what is partisan is the, is the process, um, the penetration, uh, and try to call the outcome something different, which is well, segmented or uneven state building. And, and I think you're right to try to separate those things. And now, uh, so I, well, I get from your comments, there are two main points, one about the theory and the mechanisms um, through which these cleavage structures translate into the unevenness. And the second about the scope conditions uh, under which this happens. And the scope conditions can be thought of as why in these cases and not in other cases, but also why partisan state building in some junctures at, or in some episodes within these cases at some time periods, but not in others, right? And I want to be clear on that. And you know, this is not to say, well, the Mexican state or the Colombian state have not provided public goods ever uh, in any way. It's in some way, it's a, it's a device. It's an analytical device to, to deploy um, and to try to understand in episodes of, of high polarization in some state building episodes that can have uh, long run effects, we see these, these patterns. But this in fact raises the question of, well, when uh, exactly, under what conditions can we expect for those in power, for uh, the partisan forces in power to provide public goods or to build more even states, more uniform states, as opposed to this highly segmented uneven uh, apparatuses. And so as for the first uh, question about the theory and the mechanisms, so you're right. So I do see, so imposition is, I think for me, a very important part of the mechanism is whoever is in power and is involved in this hegemonic struggles. And so you started with Weber and I also like to cite Weber in saying that the essence of politics is struggle, right? And so uh, Weber was a realist and I think in state building, we, we should we have to address that perspective. I mean, what you're trying is to defeat an enemy. And for many you know, people and many you know, social groups, the state has been uh, an enemy that is trying to you know, colonize, to in, impose uh, its, its control, sometimes with more success or less success, but it's a partisan state. And what state builders in these countries were often trying to do, it was uh, you know, impose and win in struggle. And so that is one mechanism. Now, uh, the other kind of family of mechanisms, I would say, um, and I, I think of this as two categories of mechanisms, uh, but we would need to elaborate more on each of those. But the other is, is that there is resistance precisely because uh, the state is being so partisan, then the outgroups, uh, those are not embracing the state. Some are embracing the state or some aspects of the state, but others are outright resisting uh, the state and developing a deep mistrust of state institutions. And so if conservatives were holding power for 50 years in, in Colombia, uh, you know, liberals who were excluded from the state, 
developed a deep distrust of the state. And we can see those attitudes traveling over time. And so in the book, I tried to show this continuity also in norms and attitudes uh, across different groups, but also this resistance shaped the ultimate outcomes. And so I think there's no law in when will imposition win or resistance win. I think that needs to be addressed historically and specific cases in specific instances. That would be the other kind of, and you're right, it's probably under theorized and one need, would need to, to develop more this idea, but I think the st ultimate state capacity outcomes are the joint product of these two forces of you know, imposition and resistance, and so how that gets negotiated uh, in the ground. Um, as for the scope conditions, and I think this is a fascinating question, I've been thinking about this, and I don't, I'm not sure I have a, the right answer yet. Um, so I'm not an expert in the US history, but uh, from what I read about state building in the US, it's true, parties play a big, big role. And the US is another country where you had partisan wars. I mean, partisan wars in the sense of you know, big blocks uh, fighting each other. You had a major civil war that was a partisan process of developing the state. And so the North almost, I would say, you know, colonizes the South in many ways. And at that time, it's a partisan state. Um, and Bensel, in his book, Yankee Leviathan, speaks of the US state as a party state in, in that period. I think it's only later on, and I think that the wars that the US fights, the international conflicts that the uh, US fights, and in fact, yes, the, the, the other mechanism, competition between the parties, where you get this more broad-based state building, where you see uh, you know, a collective effort in some sense being made. Um, and so that reduces the unevenness. But I would be surprised if in the US at that time period, if we were to map the state, we didn't see these kinds of alignments and different state building depending on the underlying cleavages. Now, why is it that in other uh, cases or in other historical periods, we do see even the Colombian state providing collective goods the Mexican state uh, providing collective goods. And I think it does have to do with the balance of power. And so one of the uh, good things about these two cases is that you, know, there's, you have much more balance of power in the Colombian case. In fact, you have you know, such a part, uh, balance of power that you see the two parties competing in the electoral arena. And that is important in Colombia. Uh, you now, even though this is a very partisan state and it's a very oligarchic elitist state, very restricted democracy, but it is a democracy nonetheless in the sense of there is genuine electoral competition and the two parties are competing each other. In Mexico, you have a revolutionary state that you know, you know, creates an authoritarian system and conservatives or their uh, successors in the 20th century, uh, you know, they are excluded from power and they didn't even, you can even fight elections. Uh, so the, the balance of power is part of the answer, but I think it, the, the logic of partisan state building can apply in, even in cases where there's a stalemate or where there's a, uh, larger difference. Um, I would need to think more about other cases in which, uh, for example, you mentioned uh, Costa Rica, Chile, in which it's really the competition mechanism driving collective good provision, what predominates over the partisan good uh, provision. Um, but I, uh, I thank you for, for this amazing comments, and I hope we can follow um, um, the, the conversation. And um, But for now, I, I think it would be good to open it up to to the audience and Fran and Steve. Well, you guys need to organize an Academy Alumni Club where you get together and talk uh, once a week. Um, I've got an embarrassingly long list of questions. I'm gonna try to limit this and, and weave in a few, at least a few of the audience questions. Um, so the first is that I too had some questions about scope um, and I'm not sure that um, they've been answered yet. Um, so I'm not quite sure what, Mariano, whether you're claiming that this is a process and it applies particularly well, you can show that it works particularly well in these cases, but you're not claiming it works e everywhere or are there some other functional equivalents that we could think about? So um, I'm, Wondering, we have one of the one of the questions from the audience is from one of our brilliant graduate students, Marai Orteaga, um, and she asks whether um, a strong party what 
what kind of party strength is necessary? She says the, the PRI was a strong party according to most accounts, but in Colombia, there were mixed accounts about whether the parties were strong or just loose federations of loose, yeah, of, of regional factions. So, I mean, this is one, one question about scope. I've got my own, my one question I have is whether it makes a difference if the cleavage itself is regional. I mean, if I would extend this framework beyond Mexico and Colombia, if I were to think about, and we have not, I'm sorry, we have another question from the audience that I wanted to mention. Um, I think this was from Mariano Rodriguez that um, partisan identities also went deep in these countries. But what about in countries where partisan, where, where cleavages are basically elite, um, where they don't really penetrate below? Maybe, Sebastian, these are places where there isn't a competition to provide more public goods, but where there's only the provision of selective benefits, there's only landlord armies. Um, what happens in places where um, partisan identities are not deep and they're not widespread? What happens if they're only elite? And I'm thinking here that this can happen where there's just sort of regional conflicts. Um, so what, what exactly, how, how do we, what's the takeaway about how we understand how broadly you intend this argument, this fascinating argument to apply? I mean, I've seen versions of your argument where you've applied this to a, to the specific subject area, to the Cristero resistance and to militias and to areas of violence in the, in the in, in area where the state does not control violence in Mexico today. That's absolutely fascinating. But is this, are you showing us the mechanisms by which we can understand uneven spatial um, development of the state? Or are you telling us that everywhere it will happen, it only happens, you could, we only just need to vary the cleavage in order to see who wins or who loses. I mean, I'm curious about whether there's something about these particular um, cleavages and um, and the audience is, is interested in whether there's you need strong parties or whether you need deep partisan identities or I mean, how do we understand this? And maybe I'll just toss out a second question myself. And that is that I know you to be extremely skilled uh, methodologically, so I'm sure you've thought about these questions and did not have time to address them in the shamefully short period of time that we gave you to present a very rich book. But um, when you talk about ta extractive capacity, um, you were using a measure of um, of tax of, of, of percent of revenue collection. Um, how do we know that this isn't, it's not the case that these were the, the areas of, of Catholic resistance were not areas that were poorer or that subsequently did not get more investments or more foreign investment or um, weren't naturally, June Ehrlich asked about natural geography. They didn't have ports. They weren't naturally um, uh, resource rich. I mean, how, how do we know that it's um, an uneven, state penetration rather than exogenous factors. So um, th I'm gonna leave it at that for now and give you and, and Sebastian, if he's got some thoughts about this question, a, a, a couple of minutes to answer before we hopefully will have time for Steve to ask a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, Fran. Um, this gives me an opportunity to expand a little bit. Uh, so the question about the scope conditions uh, of the theory, I think it's it's very important, and I needs to be refined. I would say these two cases are a good testing ground for this potentially more general argument, because I do think that it is important or necessary to have sustained periods of control over the state by a party for this to work. Um, I mean, in these two cases, the political regime is is very different. Um, in Mexico, you have the pre, but I'm also speaking of the period before the pre. I mean, it, it's you build a party from the state. It's, but it is a the, you can think of the revolutionaries as the party and the counter revolutionaries as the out party, and so they control the state for a sustained period of time. And so this is how it why it works. In Colombia, you have a very different political regime. You have uh, these two competitive this competitive system. But you do see something that is important and that, that I think it's important for the theory to work. That is that you get sustained periods 
of party dominance, either one of the, or the other of the parties over the state apparatus, and that they wholly penetrate the state, the, the state apparatus. I mean, when conservatives were in power in Colombia and um, during the period of the conservative hegemony, and so Sebastian made a reference uh, to this, so the conservatives really dominate from the end of the 19th century up until 1930. And so this period is known as the conservative hegemony. So liberals are still competitive and so strong in society, we would say in terms of partisan identities, they are staunchly liberal areas. But it is conservatives that control the state, and, and that means, I mean, they control from the top down and for every single office. And when liberals come to power in 1930, they build a the liberal republic, and that means, I mean, they completely get rid of conservatives in the state. So, and you have you control the state for they control the state for uh, almost two decades or for you know 16 years until this ends up in another partisan war in La Violencia. Uh, in the middle of the century. So you do have periods of sustained party control over the state in this hegemonic struggle that allows these partisan elements to actually you know, shape the institutions. I don't think this would work with parties rotating or competing parties rotating in office frequently, not because the parties don't want to outcompete the rival, but because there's not enough time to actually shape the state uh, the, the way they would want. So yes, I think the balance with a more you know, balanced structure of power and with more rotation in office among the parties, you would be less likely to see these very sharp uh, variations reflecting the, the cleavages. And so I would expect more even development. And maybe that is one way of thinking about the scope conditions. The other is what kind of Parties and I am using parties in in two senses. One is in the strictly organizational sense, you know, the party as an institution, uh, but also party as uh, in the broader sense of the term as you know the the as a faction, if you want, or as a part of society, whether organized as such or not in an institution. You could say that you know anti-clericals or the 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 Cristeros or the conservatives in Mexico, I mean, they were not really a party. They organized a party later on with the PAN, and they, there were some earlier developments trying to develop a sinarquista party. But the party in society as sort of the identities of counter-revolution were much broader, even if not coalesced in an organization. So uh, to the question in the audience, I do think that for this to work, you do need you know, partisan identities to be relatively extended in society, and this is something that the two cases share, that in this 19th century conflict, uh, there was this precocious politicization of the masses. Uh, and so these cleavages got entrenched in, in Colombia in the 19th century. I mean, you had not only people, but regions, uh, municipalities, areas being liberal or conservative, and you see the same in Mexico. And it's part, I think, that the fact that in, in unlike in Europe, I mean, you, you have periods of extended suffrage and broad political competition earlier on. And so you have uh, an earlier process of politicization of, of entrenchment of partisan identities before there is even a strong partisan, uh, a strong state structure in the first place. So this goes back to the point of what comes first, the state of the party. Well, I think in these cases, uh, there was already a partisan structure before your substantial state building, and that is part of the this sequence, uh, this reversed sequence is part of the story of why we see these unevens. Can I can I jump in with well, we want to get in another round of questions. So maybe Sebastian, maybe if we let Steve ask a couple of oh, questions, sure. then then we'll give you a chance to answer both rounds at once. Is that okay? No problem. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, quickly, let me uh, convey a couple of questions in the audience. Um, one is from Madai, which is um, a simple question, which is, but, but really important, which is how much of this process, Mariano, is top down and how much from, is, is from below in the sense that is variation, is unevenness being driven primarily by the ruling party investing or seeking to provide public goods in politically aligned areas and how much of it is being driven by opposition res 
but by re societal resistance to state building in um in, in political opposition areas now that those are, those are not necessarily two sides of the same coin you mentioned both but can you say something about sort of which is more important uh let me also convey uh a question by june which is relates to colombia and this actually relates to other area of 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 your um, dissertation book that you didn't talk about much today, Mariano, which is um, malicious. So June asks uh, about non-state actors in Colombia and guerrillas and paras and uh, drug trafficking organizations who in some ways, in some places, effectively substitute for the state by providing at least some public goods. When wars or when, when, when states extend themselves eventually, is that likely to contribute to or undermine long-run state building. I wonder if, if you might um, draw a little bit on your work on, on militias in, in Mexico to answer that question. I know we're short on time, so let me just stop with those two. Uh, thank you. I'll try to, to be you know, very quick and thanks for this question. So uh, it's true, I'm speaking of these two forces. So the uneven, say, investments of those in power, and on the other hand, the societal resistance. And so, I don't think we can just generalize and say which will prevail uh, universally. There's no law. But I think if we look at specific cases, specific arenas of the state, um, and in the cases, I find that in some, it was the imposition or the uneven investments what mattered more. In others, it was the resistance. Specifically in developing courts of institutions, it was the design of, it was, it was very much you know, the uneven investments. And so the development of the course of apparatus uh, was very shaped by this uh, partisan design. So in that respect, you would say the top-down element is more important in, in that particular uh, domain of the state in the course of the uh, design and deployment of, of the course of apparatus. When it comes to, for example, taxation, I find that there's no difference, for example, in the amount of effort based very if you want very rudimentarily, but would say the number of tax collectors, the number of tax offices, things like that, I don't see much of a difference. It comes much more from the resistance and the way in which society is reacting to that. So I think it depends on the domain of the state that we are speaking to. Now, uh, so the second question, um, the collaboration between states and militias and paramilitaries and other actors, so I, one thing that I, the way I treat them in the book, so they are non-state actors, but they are non-state actors that are all, always allied, tolerated, in some kind of pact with a partisan state. So I think it's some, we want some conceptualization issue, but I don't treat the militias or uh, these actors as non-state, independent from the state. The state simply is too weak and cannot, and so these actors spring up. They always have at least some kind of complicity with the state, with a partisan state. And so Mexico, for example, the story of the militias, the way they collaborate with the state is these militias are, in some cases, are bottom up. They, in many cases, they come from the revolution. These are peasant groups that, uh, that rebel and that central rulers have to do something with them. And what they do is they strike a deal with them they incorporate them into the army. And so they become essentially the police at the local level. And so this, um, you know, I presented this uh, in Dr. Class actually before, but you see how the core coercive apparatus in Mexico in the countryside was not a civilian police, uh, was not even so the army itself, the institutional army, it was these peasant militias that were attached to the army. And that is a very strong coercive presence. I wouldn't say that is not the state. They are the state. Locally, for these peasants, the state was the local militia, and that was the ejidatarios, and they had a gun, and the state and the army had given them that, that gun. Now, that shaped institutional development at the local level very strongly. Why? Because these militias compete with the development of civilian police forces. They stunt the development of law and order uh, institutions. And later on, we see a very strong correspondence with areas of peasant militia mobilization in the counter-revolution uh, or counter-revolution. And later on with outcomes today related to vigilantism, for example. And this is not just a statistical 
uh, coincidence over time. This is, I, I show, I trace the sequence and show that. So the vigilantes today, in some, in many cases, uh, they are former ejidatarios or their parents and grandparents were members of the peasant militia. So this really runs in the families and runs locally. And so the, and going back to another point of uh, uh, another question that Fran raised. And so how do we know that, for example, in tax collection, uh, these are not just an outcome of differences in economic development or, or geography itself. And so I, I you know I have a different forms of testing the, the arguments. Um, and I control, for example, for using historical censuses. So I di digitalized uh, the censuses for both countries. Um, but history at the municipal level. And so this holds even if we account for many geographic factors when we come when we compare uh, municipal neighbors, when we control for levels of development. And so that's how I try to isolate really the effect of the partisanship itself. Perfect. We didn't give you enough time to present your book, but at least in the question and answer period, you got to answer some, some of those points. You got to develop them further. Sebastian. Um, you've been very patient and waiting, and so I want to give you the last. No, no, no. I, I apologize. I thought that it was part of my job description in that. Uh, well, I, that, I, I could I have been, I could have been to... ambiguous as well. But please take a couple of minutes, two minutes. I've got to close in two minutes. Give me ten seconds at the end. Take one minute and fifty seconds. Okay, so I will be part of the workshop of the book. I'm very honored to do that. So I'll, I'll sort of. I, so I was, I thinking I was thinking about contributing to the book. I'm here for the sort of the, the public debate. Um, and I'm not so impressionistically, at least. Uh, the what's calling Colombia the hegemonic, the conservative hegemony, going from Nunez to 1930, it's a 50 long year hegemony, it's, it's not an hegemony at all. There is a thousand year war. In the South Thousand Year War, believe it or not, there are major concessions made to the liberals. And those ma major concessions actually uh, were big in creating this, the Colombian state. Uh, and, and this is exactly the point in which even in the case of Colombia, you have from 1905 to 1930, the elites of both parties converging on the need to provide public goods for the coffee export sector. So even in half of the, the second half of the conservative hegemony is really collusion between two parties. And if you look not at taxation, not at education, but you look at inf economic infrastructure, they are all on the same ship, absolutely on the same ship. Uh, there's no, I don't, I, I, I would like to see the granular data, but in terms of big public goods for Colombia, you have, I understand that Beber, a realistic definition is struggle, but also collusion is very Beberian. So the two parties collude against society or collude against the poor. And these were two elite parties, two oligarchies that were cooperating with each other after a very violent war, the second most violent in the America after the, the American Civil War. And they were cooperating with each other to develop the, the coffee economy. The liberals were delighted with Reyes. Uh, so I, I, there's, there's no imposition, no resistance. There's coalition or cooperation between the two parties. And the conservatives really wanted to sort of be tidy and be pretty because they knew that if they didn't deliver, the liberals were going to, 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 to replace them. Uh, so even in that case, I mean, you see, robust democrat electoral competition creating more public goods through cooperation than partisan goods through imposition so i want a ticket to the book workshop so i can see a continuation of this debate and mariano's answer in the next round to uh what's my going tickets on are very cheap Columbia. are very cheap so <laughs> um i unfortunately have to close i've already run over um but this was such a rich discussion on such an important topic among two brilliant young scholars that i just had to let it go over for a few minutes i want to thank everyone who joined us today i want to thank sebastian for your generosity um in commenting and i especially want to thank mariano for presenting 
this work that's almost done and that's going to, um, we're all going to be talking about for a long time. I've Folks, I've seen pieces of this. It's phenomenal and um, I can't recommend it enough. Um, and please come back and join us next Tuesday uh, when we'll have another fantastic seminar that will be um, shared again by Steve and um, Abortion politics in Latin America. Oh yeah, no minor topic. Abortion politics. In Latin America. Can we add the United? Can we add the say the case of Texas to this? I'm sure it'll come up. <laughs> Texas is sort of part of Latin America. Okay. See you all next week, and thanks to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care, folks. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice to Thank see you. you.